Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing Zen 5 slash Strix Point. We've been discussing an awful lot of Zen 5 information over the past few videos, but there have been some very interesting leaks now online with additional information to potential cache configuration changes for AMD's upcoming architecture. And we're going to be discussing them right after this message from the video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by OpenGX, the first web browser designed specifically for gamers. You might ask yourself, what does that mean? OpenGX is highly customizable, meaning you can customize your browsing experience with themes, wallpapers, and colors, and also force dark mode on everything, which is great for minimizing eye strain and making late night browsing a bit easier on your eyes. But this Customization goes beyond just making your browser look pretty, with powerful features in the accessibility sidebar. As you would expect, this can also be customized to your personal needs and likings. So you could choose to have Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Discord, and more of course, all set up and get notifications from when, say, your favorite streamers go live, messages from your friends, and all of this happens right within the web browser. Perhaps the coolest aspect of Opera GX, though, is the GX control option. This allows you to control how much memory the web browser uses, so you won't have to worry about the browser just swallowing up a ton of memory, like Google Chrome. And furthermore, you can also choose how much memory bandwidth Opera GX uses for, say, downloads, as well as how much CPU power it also uses, too. Many gamers, including myself, tend to have tons of tabs open, so if you're working, gaming, and just browsing the internet, this can really affect your machine's performance. And of course, this could mean that the web browser starts to become a resource hog. Finally, there's no need to switch between all of your favorite stores to check the latest deals and browse new games, as GX Corner has the best deals, newest releases, and even hand-picked free games all in one place. You never need to miss out on a deal or your next favorite game with this great built-in feature. For those of you who are on mobile, OpenGX is also available on both Android and iOS, allowing you to protect your privacy and block ads in the built-in mobile browser for gamers. So take control of your browsing experience with OpenGX, which is available for mobile on both Android and iOS, and of course, Windows and other operating systems on desktop. Either way, it's a free download. Simply visit the store or click the link in our description. Now, as a real quick refresher for those who missed my previous video, and I stress this is gonna be a real quick overview. I'm not gonna be going into detail here. I will leave a link to my previous video in the description. Basically, to my understanding with Zen 5, there are some fundamental major architectural changes, but sticking to the cache structure, as well as a little bit on the core configuration, the CCD, CCX, whatever you want to say, essentially doubles its core count. Great on me for hitting the microphone. So that basically means it goes from 8 cores to 16 cores. Now, of course, if the L3 cache remained on the CCD, that would basically just balloon up in space if we saw 16 cores, because clearly you would need a crap ton of additional L3 cache to be able to basically feed those cores. But to my understanding anyway, and I've mentioned this again in a previous video, the L3 cache is now stacked. So you can basically think of this as like the uh, 5800X3D in you know basic principle anyway. It's connected via TSVs. And then L2 cache is essentially unified across the um, entire CCD. And then L1 is also seeing a bump. So basically multiple CCDs can access the L3 cache. And then again, the L2 cache is private to that CCD. Just to reiterate, I've gone over this in much more detail in a previous video, but just wanted to give you a quick overview. Now, Grayman on Twitter is now stating that it's possible there will be some variants which actually use four levels of cache. Now, this is not something I've personally heard, but he also believes that it's very possible that we could see some type of 3D stacking here. And again, I just feel that this is most likely. I've had multiple sources now all tell me much the same thing. And Zen 5 will also see the introduction of the low power cores or heterogeneous, whatever you want to say. In Intel speak, it's going to be the big little design. The big design, the big cores, excuse me, will be the Zen 5 cores. And again, the small cores will be Zen 4. Um, just a small little bit of information, actually. I missed out on the previous video because I just forgot to add it into the slide because I don't know why. Uh, the L2 cache itself on the small cores, that actually will be seeing a 
bump. So that will be increased, but the L3 cache will be reduced. And basically, AMD are making a lot of the Zen 5 changes, to my personal understanding, for a myriad of reasons, one of which is the data center. Now, what I'm about to say is speculation based upon what Grayman has mentioned and also what I've personally been told previously by my sources. I'm going to reach out and try to find out a little bit more over the next couple of days. But it is quite possible that AMD will be offering different configurations of cache, essentially based upon usage scenario, because clearly data center and all of these other, you know, desktop, uh, Fred Ripper, even APUs will all possibly want to maybe slightly configure their cores differently. And we've seen AMD just kind of build on this philosophy, you know, like if you just look at their history, look at their patents, look at what the direction is that they're going in even for example with acquisitions like the linux you can say well gee whiz it would make sense for them to more customize each design each implementation of zen based upon its market now again i am not saying this is the case but to me anyway it does make logical sense and also while i'm on the subject of zen 5 i wanted to quickly throw in a small little update um, in my previous video, I mentioned it's possible that it could also be produced on the 4NM process, not the 3NM. I still have one source telling me that there could be some versions which could be using 4NM. Um, so basically, depending on the SKU, or maybe it's depending on the chiplet, I'm not sure. However, now I've had another source tell me that no, it's basically Zen 5 across the board is all going to be using TSMC's 3NM process. Personally, I'm not going to believe anything until I actually see that in writing, but just letting you guys know. While we're on the subject of actually uh, process nodes, I also want to mention that Grayman uh, states that both AMD and NVIDIA, NVIDIA of course for its RTX 40 series, will be using custom variants of the TSMC 5NM node. Now, NVIDIA have already confirmed that Hopper will be using this. So it's not exactly a stretch to think that, oh, they will also do the same for the RTX 40 series of cards. Now, of course, previously, up until now, there've been tons of rumors that they're gonna be using the 5NM process, but basically the 4NM is essentially an enhancement of the 5NM, so that could be how that was, or one of the previous rumors were incorrect, or maybe this rumor is incorrect, I'm not sure. But for the AMD side of things, I could actually believe the custom um, process. I don't think it's like 4NM, but again, it seems to be customized. And what I can say is that I was told a while back, actually, um, and this is, you know, just kind of one of those things I didn't really put two and two together. Um, but what I was told, and this is not a verbatim quote, but it was something along the lines of when you see AMD's 5NM products, you'll see what the node is really capable of and not what Apple did with it or something like that. I can't remember the exact quote. And I personally just didn't put together in my head that it was a custom uh, you know, uh, implementation of the node. It just didn't really dawn on me. I don't know why. You know, you kind of like hear a bunch of things and sometimes... I don't know, something, one plus one just doesn't click in your brain. Well, yeah, that happened to me, basically. So I wouldn't be surprised if Grayman's information, honestly, is correct here. And it's going to be really cool to see, for my money anyway, what the RDNA 3 as well as RTX 40 are capable of um, with undervolting. Because performance is great, but I have to tell you guys... I feel that there's going to be a crap ton of guides and optimization and tweaking and all of that stuff for both AMD and NVIDIA's products. And I speak products for AMD's CPUs as well, just to really see, you know, what what is best for the V slash F curve. You know, how much do you really want to sacrifice power consumption for frame rates? And obviously, that's a kind of, um, that's a personal thing. If you have an RTX 4090 or 4080 or whatever, no one can tell you how much watts is right. I mean, it's kind of down to you. But I suspect that there will be a lot of like power optimization discussion. And we've already seen some really cool, um, you know, demos of what you can get out of the um, 5800X3D. I think it went down to like one volt or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but it was actually crazy. And the final thing I would like to discuss with you guys is Garrett, who is a PlayStation employee. And he's now working at the game preservation team over at PlayStation. 
Now, obviously, it's a tweet, and it doesn't give a whole bunch of information away. So he's not specifically stating which product or projects he is working on. But just logically speaking, game preservation, it's not you know, it's not a chainsaw controller, let's just be honest, right, that you can kind of make some logical conclusions to what it is and what it isn't. And clearly, Sony have not quite the backwards compatibility, let's say, as Microsoft. So I feel that this would be a very, a very big win for them. And a really obvious thing that they could do would be a local PlayStation 3 emulation on the PlayStation 5. There have been so many rumors that this is a thing. And clearly we've seen, you know, with their cloud offerings, they have been considering this. Now, definitely you could do it on the PlayStation 3. That, uh, sorry, PlayStation 3 emulation on the PlayStation 5. We've already, of course, seen it on the desktop. But outside of that, game preservation is a really big topic. And quite frankly, you know, there are many other channels which are much better um, at discussing game preservation than perhaps I would be. Uh, but, you know, or at least in terms of like, the whole you know, sphere of, um, you know, their fight because they've been really pushing that fight. But ultimately, it's like a lot of services now, once they shutter, you can't access the games. You guys know the story by now. And it's just kind of, um, there are so many titles on legacy platforms which are basically like you're screwed um and even on legacy consoles like for example the sega saturn um which is not blaming sony this is like a, a getting very off topic it's more of an extreme example but games like for example shining the holy ark or uh, panzer dragon saga the only way really you can play those games now of course is emulation um, because the games are long out of print and also there were not exactly billions of copies of those games sold. So game preservation, both on the physical form, but even digital as well, uh, games could be removed from the store. And for, you know, circling back to Sony, you've got loads of games on the PlayStation 3, for example, which essentially are stuck on the platform, right? It's that simple. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how, if they are going this route with PlayStation 3 emulation, and frankly, this is another thing that I don't, I will only believe it when I physically see an announcement from Sony, um, but it'll be very interesting to see how rights are handled for this, because, you know, I suspect some studios, the, you may not even, they, you know, some of the studios may have even shuttered or lost publishing rights or whatever, so... Again, I will be really curious to see how Sony handles this. Um, you could also certainly do a crap ton of enhancements because PlayStation 3 GPU is basically like, you know, <laughs> it, it's nothing right now. You know, the Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, just absolutely ruffle stomp something like an Xbox 360 GPU. So you could do something along the lines of, you know, have the game running at a much higher internal resolution, you know, throw crap tons of MSAA or whatever you wanted to do. You know, you could you could do a lot of stuff. And we've seen that, of course, on uh, PC emulators where you can choose like higher resolutions. And again, none of that is uh, exactly news. But, yeah, we could start to see some really cool products. P possibly even Sony could do something along the lines of, like, you know, custom textures. But, frankly, I think that would be, you know, dream, work, uh, dream world stuff. Because at that point, you know, if they're creating custom textures for games or something like that, you know, 4K textures for, like, an old game, you might as well just release the game as, like, a remaster. So I don't think they would do that. But, anyway, I think I've uh, rambled enough on this topic and uh, let me know your thoughts on this one down below. Like, what would your idea of, like, game preservation be? Do you think we're going to see a PS3 uh, a local emulator for the PlayStation 5? A boy can dream. With that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.